Good evening. Good evening. My name is Karen Wright Marsh. I'm the ex Executive Director of Theological Horizons. And it's my great privilege on behalf of Theological Horizons and the Project on Lived Theology here at the University of Virginia to welcome you to today's CAPS Lecture in Christian Theology by Dr. Stanley Hauerwas. We give great thanks to the generosity of Dr. and Mrs. W. Jerry Capps, who are here with us today. And the Capps Lecture Series has brought eminent Christian thinkers to the heart of the university since 2001 to explore the relationship between faith and responsibility. Jerry and Catherine, we are so grateful to both of you. Following Dr. Hauerwas's remarks, there will be time for question and answer. And today's lecture is being live streamed on Facebook at Theological Horizons at our page, and it will be archived there for the near future. And then on our website, theologicalhorizons.org after that. A selection of books by Stanley Hauerwas are for sale in the back, um, and he is happy to sign them um, after the lecture. Dr. Stanley Hauerwas is contemporary theology's foremost intellectual provocateur. In the face of religious complacency, he insists that the message of Jesus is a startling one to which Christians, for the most part, have never been fully faithful. Christians, he believes, are called to be a pilgrim people who will always find themselves in one political community or another but who are never defined completely by those communities. But rather, as the body of Christ on earth, Christians must be a peculiar people, a sign of contradiction. Dr. Stanley Hauerwas is the Gilbert T. Rowe Professor Emeritus of Divinity and Law at Duke University. He most recently assumed a chair in theological ethics at the University of Aberdeen. His work cuts across disciplinar disciplinary lines, systematic theology, philosophical theology and ethics, political theory, as well as the philosophy of social science and medical ethics. Dr. Hauerwas's numerous books include The Work of Theology, published in 2015, Hannah's Child, A Theological Memoir, and Approaching the End, Eschatological Reflections on Church, politics, and life. What you already may know about Stanley Hauerwas is that Time Magazine dubbed him the best theologian in America, that his book, A Community of Character Toward a Constructive Christian Social Ethic, was selected as one of the most important books on religion in the 20th century. What, what you will know as soon as you hear him speak is that Stanley Hauerwas is from Texas and comes by his somewhat, shall we say, frank style as something of a birthright. What you may not know about Stanley Hauerwas is that he went to work as a bricklayer the summer he turned seven years old, that he played softball into his 60s and is a mean catcher, from what I hear, and that he can tell a terrific theological joke. And yes, there is such a thing. It's been said that you, if you were to ask Dr. Hauerwas to define himself by a single word, that once he got Texan out of the way, he would probably say disciple and add that anyone who uses the word, in his words, better damn well mean it. The title of today's CAPS lecture in Christian, Christian theology is Christianity is Madness, Kierkegaard and the Academy. By Dr. Hauerwas's telling, Søren Kierkegaard has long been a significant influence on his life and work. He writes, I always have the sense that I am such a beginner when it comes to knowing how to be a Christian. How is the heart of the matter for me? When I first read Kierkegaard, I was taken by his suggestion that the what of Christianity is not the problem, it is the how. I have spent many years trying to say that we cannot understand the what of Christianity without knowing how to be a Christian. 
So the two contrarians, one from Copenhagen and one from Pleasant Grove, Texas, still challenge us. Kierkegaard once proclaimed that his goal was to reintroduce Christianity to Christendom, and he asked, what does it mean that all these thousands and thousands call themselves Christians at a ma as a matter of course? These many, many men of whom the greater part, so far as one can judge, live in categories quite foreign to Christianity. In our own time, Stanley Hauerwas has said, I assume most of you are here because you think you are Christians, but it is not at all clear to me that the Christianity that has made you Christians is Christianity. So that leaves us with a very urgent question today. What is Christianity and what does madness have to do with it? So we are here to consider that and I give you Dr. Stanley Hauerwas. It's lovely to be back at the University of Virginia, and thank you, Karen, for that lovely introduction. Uh, I've, I've been at Virginia so often, I feel like it's my second academic home. You may not feel that, but um, uh, it's, a, it's a great um, pleasure to be here. I, I've taught seminars. Every time someone used to go on sabbatical, they drug me up from Durham to do a seminar, so I, I, I know many people and have close friends here. And I forgive you for beating Duke last weekend. Uh, the, uh, uh, we were terrible. And we got to play Florida State uh, on Saturday, so there you are. It's no accident that Christianity developed a scholarly theological tradition, which over time found its way into the university. That is to put the matter in a misleading way, I think. It is not that theology found its way into the university, but universities, particularly the universities of Paris and Oxford, were constituted by theologians at work. They were lively debates about what other disciplines might need to be included in the curriculum, but the central role of theology was never questioned. I mean, that, that Christianity produces its own internal critics it is a fact that I think is um, not to be uh, overlooked. It's quite significant for a tradition to do that. It is a fascinating question why Christians have needed people who think they have to think about what being a Christian means. I think the church needs theologians because she cannot hide from herself as much as she might like to that she believes the one that moves the sun and the stars is to be found in the person of a first century Jew named Jesus. To make such a claim and even more to make your life turn and depend on it, as we say in the South, requires a good deal of thought. And thought has to be take place somewhere. For centuries, monasticism was a good home for theology, but then came the university. The university, of course, has changed over the years. One of the most important changes is called enlightenment. The university that gave birth to the enlightenment and became the primary agent of, the, of that movement. That it did so is not surprising given the enlightenment's desire to free humanity from all authority except reason alone. The transformation of the university by advocates of the enlightenment meant those who would have theology taught in the university bore the burden of proof of course, the great classical text is Kant's Conflict of the Faculties, in which he suggested that, uh, I think somewhat ironically, that divinity and our theology and divinity and the, the law were in the higher faculties because they served the state. Philosophy dealt with truth. The strategies developed to legitimate theology as a university discipline meant after the birth of the Enlightenment University that theology and modernity was no longer an ecclesial discipline. At best, the theology became but another subject in the curriculum of the modern university. Theology so understood often became no more than a report about what Christians at one time believed. 
This is thought to be a useful task because students who may well be Christians lack a robust knowledge of the Christian tradition. Yet even a report on what Christians at one time believed can be quite controversial if the subject is not taught in a disinterested way. Religious convictions that have cost believers their lives are now presented in a fashion that will let students make up their own minds. So constituted, it's quite difficult for students not to think that theology is just a matter of opinion. I say departments of religious studies um, so oftentimes are where people uh, uh, teach religi a religion if it's dead or they can kill it. Um, many people who teach theology or some discipline such as biblical studies desperately try to avoid any suggestion that they are trying to indoctrinate students, when it, indoctrination seems to me is a very good word. Faculty who now comprise Department of Religious Studies have strong reasons not to be identified as theologians, that is, people that have normative commitments. Their methods are social scientific or historical because those methods are accepted by the university. Theology, on the other hand, is assumed not to pass muster. As a result, most students, even students at Christian colleges and universities, have little opportunity to take courses in theology. At least they have little opportunity to take courses in theology that are taught with the presumption that the course can and perhaps should make a difference in their life. It is also the case that there are, that there are social and political presumptions that are challenged by the courses in theology. Take, for example, the widespread presumption that in religious matters, the distinction between the public and the private is a given. That distinction is often assumed to be crucial for sustaining liberal social orders that depend on relegating our strongest convictions to the alleged private realm. That presumption must be challenged if theology is taught well. When it is not challenged, the student cannot help but conclude that theological convictions are not subject to questions of truth or falsity, with the added implication that theological claims cannot be subject to reason. I mean, that, the distinction between the public and the private is, gives you locutions such as people saying, I believe Jesus is Lord, but that's just my personal opinion. I mean, you wonder um, uh, what, what, what produces that. Um, I suspect Kierkegaard would have found these developments deeply ironic. He was, of course, a person of extraordinary intelligence, but he seems to have had no desire uh, to be associated with the university. He wrote, on his, he wrote on his own authority. Moreover, he did not write to be read by other theologians. He wrote to change the world, or at least the lives of those who would read him. That he did so raises the interesting question, of whether Kierkegaard could be taught in the current university objectively, because object objectivity would require that the teacher make clear that Kierkegaard is not someone you simply learn about. When read rightly, the reader experiences an encounter. Kierkegaard wants your life. That Kierkegaard wrote outside the university does not mean he did not value the university. He not only went to the University of Copenhagen, but he seems to have been an exemplary student. Walter Lowry, for example, observes that in his first years in the university, Kierkegaard was extremely diligent, not only because he thought to be so was his duty, but, he also, but also because he rejoiced in the opportunity for broader culture which was there offered to him, or which the free life of the university student made possible. Later, Kierkegaard would study in Berlin, which at the time represented what most considered the zenith of academic culture. As a result, Kierkegaard was well-versed in ancient and contemporary philosophy, attending, for example, Schelling's lectures on Hegel. In short, Kierkegaard could not have been the great critic of church and university if he had not received an education that only a university can provide. I mean, part of what I'm engaged in so far is a typical genre of university lecture, criticizing the university, because that's what university lecturers do. <laughs> These meandering reflections about theology, the university, and Kierkegaard, reflections that would demand acknowledgement that universities come in quite different shapes and sizes, are in the interest of trying to imagine what or how Kierkegaard might help us think 
about theology in the university. I mean, it, uh, we oftentimes use the word university and think it, it covers everything that goes on in the university. But universities are wonderfully specific. I mean, years ago, I was, I was giving a lecture at Iowa State and I was running around, I, I was a jogger and I started, it was dark when I started and I was running around the campus and I passed this huge building with ionic columns and I got completely lost and as, I, as the sun came up, I came back around that, in front of that building and then above the ionic columns was chiseled milk. And I thought, what a wonderful way to organize knowledge. I, I mean, uh, uh, if you put the Department of English under milk, um, uh, you would have had a quite different uh, um, a way of thinking about knowledge. And I mean, these are, uh, universities do that, and, I, and it all to their good. One way to put the matter is to ask if and how Kierkegaard can be, if, if and how Kierkegaard can be taught in most universities today. He was unapologetically Christian. He sought to reintroduce Christianity into Christendom. Can his work be taught with the same seriousness with which he did his work? I will return to this question in the conclusion of this lecture. There is, of course, the question of whether the changed circumstances in which we live mean Kierkegaard's work no longer has the relevance that it did in his day. The university in Kierkegaard's time was still a Christendom institution. That is no longer the case. Does that mean we no longer have anything to learn from Kierkegaard's attack on Christendom? I do not think that to be the case, but to say why it will require attention to Kierkegaard's understanding of Christendom and why he thought such an arrangement made it difficult to be a Christian. As I've already indicated, most contemporary universities no longer identify with their Christian past. The, uh, uh, as you know, uh, we, uh, uh, at, at the entrance of Duke Chapel, uh, you have a classical Christendom um, um, set of statues. On one side was Thomas Jefferson, don't ask me why, <laughs> Lee, and Sidney Lanier. <laughs> You've never heard of Sidney Lanier. He was a minor Southern poet. Now, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> On the other side were the heroes, um, Luther, Calvin, and Savarola. <laughs> well, as, as you know, um, uh, we took Lee down. And um, uh, I, 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 I thought we should have taken Lee down many years ago. Who wants a military man to guard God's sacrifice of the altar? We took him down because, of course, of race, but I would have thought that there would have been deeper reasons, not deeper reasons, but other reasons that we might have taken him down. But he's been taken down. And that, all that, of course, was underwriting a certain... Um, uh, view of Christianity and culture. Um, it is nonetheless the case that even though most contemporary research universities no longer identify with their Christian beginnings, that does not mean they have ceased being agents of, to be sure, a very different Christendom. These are clearly not theoretical issues for me. I'm declared lover of the university. I mean, my life has been in the university. For it sustained me. I, I went to school at, at 18 at Southwestern University in Georgetown, Texas, and I've never left. <laughs> I mean, the university has sustained me. So I'm a deep lover of the university. In the state of the university, academic knowledge is in the knowledge of God. I was quite critical of the university for being such good servants of reigning economic and political interest. Yet in the state of the university, I offer no account of the university that might be an alternative to universities we now inhabit. I offered no alternative because I'm unsure what such a university would look like. I also worry that a university that paraded its Christianity would find it difficult to maintain a radical perspective. How that might be done, that is how Christians might reclaim the university as a servant of Christ, I hope to explore by attending to Kierkegaard's attempt to introduce Christianity into Christendom. 
that I hope to find resources in Kierkegaard for thinking through how to think theologically about the university, as well as how to do theology even in the university, may seem quite odd. Kierkegaard could be quite devastating when he satirically depicts professors who wrote books about books, particularly books about him. He also knew he was destined to be a subject of study by professors who would write learned treatises on what he must have really meant by a leap of faith or whether he had disavowed reason or whether he was a philosopher or theologian. From Kierkegaard's perspective, to try to so place him betrayed his attempt to help us see that how, the how of theology is as important as the what, what Karen uh, draw attention to. It is ironic, a category Kierkegaard loved, that Kierkegaard, the one person who had taken his task to be introducing Christian, Christianity into Christendom, has become the creature created by professors in the interest of making him just another theologian with a position. By, attempt, by attending to Kierkegaard's attack on Christendom, I hope to recover why his theology should continue to challenge us. Yet I think the situation in which we find ourselves is quite different than the Christendom Kierkegaard confronted. He wanted to introduce Christianity, which turned out to be Jesus, back into Christendom. We no longer live in a robust Christendom like that of Kierkegaard's Denmark, which may mean we need to rethink what it means to do theology in a manner that defies the attempt to defang what Christians say we believe. In order to try to get clear on these matters, I need to remind us what Kierkegaard thought to be the problem called Christendom. His authorship was designed to create readers capable of being able to follow Christ in a world in which everyone assumed they were Christians. He wrote to create a reader, and I will try, therefore, to describe his attack on Christendom without that description betraying his desire to make us individuals. Kierkegaard begins his book, The Point of View my, for My Work as an Author, a Report to History, by explaining why he's never written using, uh, by explaining why he's written using different pseudonyms. He has done so, he confesses, because Christendom is a prod prodigious illusion that cannot be challenged using direct communication. One cannot challenge an illusion, Kierkegaard suggests, using direct communication, because direct communication presupposes the receiver's ability to receive it in good order. But in Christendom, the ability to receive has been lost because it is assumed that the one is a Christian just as one is a Dane. The problem is deep because the illusion makes it impossible for the one under the illusion to recognize that they are under an illusion. That is why one must first use caustic means if one is to get a message past the illusion. According to Kierkegaard, a caustic powerful enough to challenge the illusion will often take the form of the negative means in which the truth may appear the same as deception. What is the illusion that forces Kierkegaard to use deceptive strategies in the hopes of creating a reader? It is the presumption by the citizens of Denmark that they are Christians because they live in a Christian country. Why are we to make Kierkegaard wonders of the reality that thousands call themselves Christians, yet they live in categories quite foreign to being a Christian? For example, Kierkegaard observes, there are people who never enter a church, people who take oaths in God's name, people for whom it has never dawned that they might have an obligation before God, nonetheless consider themselves Christians. In a like manner, there are people who are buried as Christians by the church, who are recognized by Christians by the state, who may even call themselves Christians, although they may not believe in God's existence. Given the conditions of Christendom, these same people still consider themselves as followers of Christ. This illusion, moreover, is sustained by the assumption that 18 centuries of Christianity are sufficient to confirm the truth of what Christians believe. Yet Kierkegaard counters that assumption, arguing that those 18th centuries have contributed not an iota of proof for sustaining the truth of Christianity.
Indeed, the opposite has been the case, as those 18th centuries have, quote, contributed with steady increasing power to do away with Christianity. He sought to make us contemporaneous with Christ. Kierkegaard does not deny that Christianity has rightly had an effect on the world. Christ's name is proclaimed and believed throughout the world. The doctrines surrounding Christ have changed the face of the world, permeating all relationships. Accordingly, many assume that the history of the triumph of Christianity to take over the world is sufficient to establish that Jesus is who he says he was, namely, he was God. Kierkegaard responds to this claim with the emphatic, no. History has not established who he is because history and the effects of Christianity in history cannot substantiate the claims that Jesus was the Son of God. At most, appeals to historical effects may show that Jesus was a great or good person, but faith in Jesus as the Son of God is of a different order. Any claim to the contrary is blasphemy. I can't help but think about, um, I was giving a lecture once at Northwestern College in Orange City, Iowa. Um, uh, it is, uh, there are five churches in Orange City, three are Dutch Reform and two are Christian Reform. They would consider that pluralism. Um, uh, I, um, uh, I mean, it, it is, if you ever wanted Christendom, it, uh, that was it. And I, I, I got up, uh, again, I was jogging. It was little, right before Christmas. I got up and it was dark, and I was jogging up and down the two main streets of Orange City, Iowa. And uh, as the sun slowly came up, I realized their Christmas decorations were up. And their Christmas decorations um, were kind of Lake Wobegonish um, uh, tinsel on plywood. But they, um, uh, they had um, uh, stringers that in the, in the center between the two poles was Augustine's symbol of the Trinity with the three circles. And on each side were, uh, and this is Christmas, were crosses. And I suddenly thought, Calvinism was that form of Christianity that came out into the world to take over the world and instead it took over Orange City, Iowa. So uh, that, um, uh, that is, um, uh, that's what took over, uh, it, it was Lutheranism that took over um, uh, the Danes, but uh, it worked the same. What must be acknowledged, Kierkegaard argues, is that from any human point of view, Christianity is and must be a form of madness. It is so because only through a consciousness of sin can one come to the one who can save. Accordingly, Christianity must display itself as madness in order that the qualitative infinite emphasis may fall upon the fact that only consciousness of sin is the way of entrance. Indeed, this is the kind of consciousness that is the exact opposite of the kind of awareness that Christendom sponsors namely the attitude which expresses admiration for Jesus. Such a form of consciousness is a fraud, a self-defeat, but one common to Christendom. It is so because in Christendom, Christ is exalted to confirm our self-deceptions, the deepest deception being that we do not have to lose our lives to be a disciple of Jesus. Every time I think about that, I think about that exchange between Clarence Jordan and his brother uh, of Amer America's farm. Um, um, Clarence, uh, it, you know, it's the, it was the farm in which Clarence Jordan uh, worked to integrate uh, white and African-American families right outside America's, right outside where Jimmy Carter um, was raised. And um, uh, Clarence Jordan, um, was having trouble getting LP gas uh, delivered to the farm because they didn't want to support his, um, his an integrated um, farm. And uh, his brother was a lawyer. Uh, and uh, Clarence went to his brother and said, would you see if you could get the gas people to uh, bring gas out to our place? He said, it's, it's against the law not to deliver 
um, gas during the winter when because people could freeze. And his brother said, Clarence, you know I can't do that. And Clarence said, now why? He said, well, Clarence, I hate to say this to you, but everyone knows, and he used a very bad word, you are a blank lover. And that, he says, and I've got political ambitions, Clarence. If I tried to help you, I could never be elected to anything. And Clarence said, now, wait just a minute. I seem to remember you and I were baptized on the same day, weren't we? He said, that's right, Clarence, we were. And he said, well, now, I promised to follow Jesus as his disciple. What did you promise? He said, Clarence, I'm, I'm an admirer of Jesus, but I'm not a disciple. <laughs> and Clarence said, well, I think you need to go back to church and tell them that you're an admirer. <laughs> I think most of us are admirers. What those shaped by Christendom cannot fathom is that there is an intrinsic connection between truth and martyrdom for, for Kierkegaard. For Kierkegaard, the crowd is untruth, and it was the crowd that crucified Christ. I was asked, I was, I was asked to preach at the Divinity School on Election Day, uh, and um, I pointed out there was a democratic moment in the Gospels. They shouted, crucify him. <laughs> Although Jesus addressed himself to all, the, all he, re, he refused to have dealings with a crowd as a crowd. He was not trying to win a popularity contest or be elected. He would, he would be what he is, that is the truth which is the condition necessary to produce that strangest of all characters in Kierkegaard, that is, the individual. That character is to be found among those who recognize that the hard truth, a truth that cannot be acknowledged by the crowd, is that everyone who, is true, who would truly serve the truth is ipso ipso, in one way or another, a martyr. What Christendom occludes, or even more troubling, what Christendom loses, in fact, is Jesus. The reason, is so the reason it is so difficult to be a Christian in Christendom for Kierkegaard is that one cannot help but think that being a Christian is to identify with the 1800 years of the effects of, G of Christianity rather than with Jesus, who is the Christ. When Christianity becomes something other than faith in Jesus as the Christ, it can no longer claim to be true. For Christ is the truth in a manner that makes clear that the truth cannot be abstracted from any explanation of what the truth is. Thus, Kierkegaard's claim that the truth, in the sense that Christ was the truth, is not a collection of sentences, not a definition of concepts, but rather the truth in its essence is the reduplication in us that his life is the very being of truth, because as the truth is a life, as the truth was in Christ, for, they, for he was the truth. I often suggest to my students, if you need a theory of truth to think that Jesus was raised from the dead, worship that theory, don't worship Jesus. In, in, Christendom, in Christendom, however, Christians assume that knowing about Christ is the equivalent of believing in him, but that cannot be true. It cannot be true because Jesus called those who would follow him to be disciples. To become a disciple is to acquire another self, to become a different creature. A disciple may appear to be a student, but a student may learn without being transformed. In contrast, the disciple undergoes conversion because the truth that possesses her is one in which the one who is the truth cannot be abstracted from what makes the truth true. These are complex matters that are often misunderstood because as Kierkegaard knew, those determined by the habits of Christendom cannot help but find such an account of truth extreme. One of the ironies of being, true, of being a true Christian in Christendom is the necessity to have one's faith hidden. To be a Christian is to have a hidden inwardness, according to Kierkegaard, because if one's Christianity were known, some people might wish to, to honor and celebrate you for being a Christian. 
As a result, a true Christian must remain in hidden inwardness. Kierkegaard observes that there is a great irony that true Christians must remain hidden. In the first centuries of the church, if Christians could be recognized by their enemies, they could be put to death. In the triumphant church of Christendom, which the name is the name Kierkegaard gives to the current day Christendom church, the danger is that Christians are not put in danger by being Christian, but rather Christians are rewarded and honored because of exactly their being Christians. In contrast to the triumphant church, the early church was a militant church. The militant church, moreover, alone was the church, according to Kierkegaard. The triumphant church, as well as the very concept of Christendom, is vain conceit. Nowhere is that, more, nowhere is that vanity more apparent than the triumphant church's inability to produce martyrs. The triumphant church has the illusion that she has conquered the world, but in fact, the world conquered her. The triumphant church may make much of the doctrines that allegedly constitute the faith. The triumphant church may celebrate her orthodoxy, therefore, but she fails to see that Christianity is not doctrine, but rather a life named Jesus. Paul Homer indicates the connections Kierkegaard is trying to make um, uh, Paul Homer, I'm sorry, indicates the connection Kierkegaard is trying to make, suggests that the heart of Kierkegaard's representation of Christian convictions is the pragmatic significance of the person of Jesus Christ. Homer observes that Kierkegaard assumed that books can be written about Jesus just as they can be written about Plato. Books can be written to give objective accounts of the teachings of this or that person an account of the institutions such figures challenged or which institutions supported them can be described. It is also the case that such studies can try to establish the significance of each person. Yet Kierkegaard's point, according to Homer, is that historical accounts fail to describe Jesus because he's presented in abstraction from the demands he places on those who would follow him. Jesus can only be known with the when the interests, the passions Jesus asks of his followers, the demand that we live by dying, win by losing, receive by giving, are con constitutive of what it means to be a follower of Christ. To do justice to Kierkegaard's understanding of what is required to introduce Christianity into Christendom re would require a much fuller account of his work. But hopefully I've said enough to suggest what might follow what followed for the challenges Christians face if we're to serve the university as followers of Christ. The irony of Christendom is central to Kierkegaard's work, but this is lost if Jesus' claim on us is not the counterpoint. Kierkegaard undertook the thankless task of trying to help Christians see Jesus in a culture that assumed Jesus could be seen just by looking. We may face a quite different challenge in our day. Kierkegaard, as I hope I've suggested, took as his task to be the introduction of Christianity into Christendom. As I suggested, we may be in a quite different space and time. To be sure, we are creatures of Christendom that is rapidly disappearing. Fragments of its existence still give some the hope that a Christian world can be recovered. Many universities and colleges are institutions that represent some of those fragments just to the extent that you live in the tension between their Christian past and their uncertain future. By uncertain future, I do not mean whether they will survive, though it appears many will not survive, that is, Christian institutions, but rather what kind of self-understanding will be available to avoid becoming just another university. Self-understanding can be but a nice way of saying ideology. I wish I could pretend to have some suggestions about what a university committed to being of service to the church might look like. I think, however, it's not first a question about the university, but about the church. Do we have a church sufficiently distinctive to produce people with the imaginations to create and sustain knowledge of the world that can be described as Christian? That a college or university is sponsored and supported by Christians is not without use 
But the crucial question, as I tried to suggest in the state of the university, is whether the disciplines that contribute to the curriculum of such universities reflect the Christian difference. For, for example, um, just to take an example in, in my own location, uh, my good friend Grant Wacker, uh, who is an American church historian, teaches American Christianity. I always kid him and say, Grant, why don't you teach the church's story of America? I mean, the very idea that, uh, that you begin with America qualifying Christianity means that you're creating quite a legitimating narrative of a reality that is quite different than what the church is. That does not mean that every discipline in such a university will be different from its counterpart in non-Christian universities. The assumption, for example, uh, is that many of the sciences will not necessarily have what might be considered Christian content, but they may still be questions surrounding education in the sciences that Christians should care about. For example, I should think that no science in a university supported by Christians should be taught that does not teach the history of the science. Too often I fear that the teaching of sciences in the modern university presupposes a reductionistic metaphysical materialism that cannot be justified, but is never made articulate and therefore much less defended as internal to the science itself. That the history of a science must be taught at least offers the opportunity for those in the science to make the fundamental presumptions of the science open to investigation. I've never been sympathetic with the uh, claim, can't we put God into evolution? I'd be more than happy if you could put philosophical investigations into evolutionary theory. That would be interesting. Um, uh, uh, exactly to call into question some of the uh, kinds of causal presuppositions associated with evolutionary theory. I, I don't want you to misunderstand, I'm a committed Darwinian. I mean, what, what, a wonderful, what a wonderful reminder Darwin gave Christianity to remind us that we're animals. We're animals. We had forgotten that. Um, uh, I mean, uh, the fundamental theological notion is we're creatures. We're all creatures and that that should be at the center of biological science. I've called attention to the sciences because they are usually assumed to be the most determinative challenge to the kind of account I'm trying to give concerning what a, uni uh, concerning what a university that calls itself Christian must do. As a matter of fact, I happen to think the sciences are the best moral training that uh, students receive today. I mean, the students, um, um, I mean, they can go into a Milton class and say, oh, I know this, I've done poetry. Um, uh, so uh, my, my views count. Um, if, if they go into a physics class and say, after six weeks, you know, I'm not sure about this electron stuff. Um, uh, 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 they're told, well, we don't care what you're uh, um, sure of, kid. Get out. Go to divinity school. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> so kids, kids receive better training. Moral, that's moral training in the sciences than they do in the humanities. Um, the humanities, however, are no less a challenge than the sciences. How history, for example, should be understood and taught to reflect how Christians understood their place in the world will be and cannot help but be an ongoing debate. Descriptions are everything. Um, I taught 14 years at Notre Dame. It wasn't called Reformation, it was called the Great Schism. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I mean, that changes how, I mean, that, that's a different world. Um, or why should Christians assume what is called the American Revolutionary War was a just war? I mean, that's assumed. I mean, Americans were on the right. Really? How do you know? 
One of the other questions that the very existence of such a university would raise is whether the parents of children who have been formed in such a university would be happy with the results such a university might have on their children. Um, my wife and I were involved with the Wesley Fellowship for many years at, uh, at Duke, and Will Willimon, my friend that was dean of the chapel, got a call from a parent and said, what in the hell have you done with our daughter? <laughs> we sent her to Duke to major in history and to go to law school. She got involved with some crazy religious group, the Wesley Fellowship, and, <laughs> and says now she wants to be a missionary nurse in Honduras. You've ruined her life. Uh, <laughs> I mean, these. I mean, that, that's a um, real uh, kind of of uh, trade-off. A child educated in such a university will not will not have been educated necessarily to be a success. Students shaped by an education in an economics department that took seriously Jesus' strictures against possessions might be ill-prepared to do good to be good players in the market. Would the parents of students formed by the Department of Economics so conceive want their children back? What does all this have to do with Kierkegaard? Kierkegaard attacked Christendom, the kind of university I seem to think we need in the light of a, of a dying Christendom may suggest I'm trying to reestablish something like Christendom. Sam Wells has observed that any time Christian is used as an adjective, you have an indication that some kind of Constantinianism is at work. I think he's right about that, and that is why I've not used the description Christian University, but rather referred to Christian support of the university. Yet I cannot deny that no matter how the matter is phrased, the kind of university I want seems to make the church a civilizational reality. But that is what I want. That is, I want Christians to produce a material culture that can find expression through the disciplines represented in a university. If that is Constantinianism, so be it. I find it hard, however, to think such an understanding of the Christian stake in producing something like the university to be Constantinian if it's remembered that the church that makes such a university possible is the one determined by a Jesus that Kierkegaard called our attention to. A university so conceived, for example, could not organize courses in politics on the presumption that violence must be assumed necessary for the cooperative work necessary for the discovery of goods in common. Perhaps another way to put the matter is to observe what a loss it would be if Christians lacked a context for the study of Kierkegaard. The challenge, of course, is how to present such a study how to prevent such a study from becoming a way to avoid Kierkegaard's challenge to our complacency about how to live as Christians. Kierkegaard can only be taught well just to the extent he's allowed to call into question our very existence as Christians. In a like manner, a university determined by Christian practices will be, will be by necessity an institution that desires to change the student's life. I do not think a university so conceived is antithetical to Kierkegaard's attack on Christendom. We obviously no longer live in a Christendom like Denmark. To be sure, it's not yet clear what the status of the church will have in the new world that's a mourning. But in the meantime, a non-established church can use the shards left from the old dispensation of Christendom to sustain her life. One of those shards was a strange man named Soren Kierkegaard. How fortunate for us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Harawas has agreed to take some questions. Um, ben is going to bring the mic to you. Um, we're recording this, and we'd like to hear you. But um, Dr. Harawas, you will. Absolutely. Respond. All right. Try to respond. <laughs> okay. And I will let you, um, if you have a question, maybe um, raise your hand. Um, Dr. Harawas will recognize you. 
and Ben will bring you the mic. So if you could just hold on till, till the mic comes to you, that'd be great. Hi. Um, one of your points that you'd made previously was um, that one of the worst things we can do to people is force them to accept our definition. Of them. And so often the church does that to people. And so often do medical professions, educational professions, and a variety of other professions. How can we train people to do better in that area? Like porcupine screw very carefully. <laughs> uh, uh, um, there's just, there's no, I say it that because there's no in principle answer to that question. Um, um, as, as a person committed to nonviolence, I assume it's persuasion all the way down. But the very descriptions you use as part of the persuasion is part of the kind of formation for which the person receiving didn't uh, pay their dues for it to begin with. So, all, I mean, I cannot imagine an education that is not an indoctrination. I mean, ju just, I mean, anybody that's ever made out a syllabus knows you're indoctrinating. What is it you haven't said? What is it you haven't mentioned? Uh, why is it you think this is significant? So the only, hope is that you are able to introduce students to a tradition in a way that in the process of learning how to be a, um, a proponent and an actor in that tradition, they are able to question the way that you have introduced them to it. And that's one of the tests of a tradition. Uh, I, behind my remarks are uh, McIntyre's understanding of epistemological crisis um, uh, in Whose Justice, Which Rationality, where traditions are more nearly um, um, legitimate to the extent that they put themselves into question and recognize when another tradition has put themselves, put themselves into question into a uh, question. And um, uh, that's a tricky business. It's a tricky business. Thank you. Um, so I'm a student at the University of Virginia. I, um, I'm majoring in English and Religious Studies, so two uh, majors that often have very like diverse and very liberal professors. Um, but in mentioning the idea of like creating syllabus, um, I often find that my professors have a lot of ideals of diversity and inclusion and uh, like live these things out, and yet my syllabi remain starkly white and like almost everyone on my syllabus are always men. Um, and so, you know, as someone talking about tradition, you know, like the entire tradition of Christianity has largely been one of white male writers. Um, and so I guess my question would be like, how do we balance teaching this tradition while also honoring like new thoughts or honoring the thoughts of people who haven't been spoken about or have, haven't had the ability to speak or be put on syllabi? Well, first of all, let me say I think diversity is an empty notion, which uh, is used uh, around the university today to um, 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 give solace to nervous liberals, but they don't know what they mean by it. Um, um, the, um, you don't, I mean, um, Jesse Helms, I don't want at my university. Uh, um, 
when, when dead or alive. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so there's a deep limit um, to diversity that people are going to find. Um, and, and so they have to be argued about. It's, it's like, I mean, the language of free speech right now, I think, is out of control. Um, um, marketplace of ideas is just capitalist ideology. Um, a speech that is free is going to cost you something. Um, now, to your question, once I got that off my chest. Um, I, um, um, I think one of the great gifts, um, my own view, the Enlightenment was the, the pot was the result of 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 certain forms of Christianity finding expression to critique Christianity. We wouldn't have discovered, I think, uh, the significance of women to be fully involved as. Uh, in the church without the Enlightenment. So we've got to give thanks for that result, which then allows us to reread the history in a way that um, uh, we discovered there really was a Hildegard of Bingen. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and that, um, uh, that she may scare the hell out of us, but um, uh, she was clearly possessed by the spirit. Uh, I think also um, part, one of the people, some of the people that get left out of, of the kind of narrative you're, that you call our attention to are poor people. They, I mean, who, d who didn't necessarily leave records. And um, we, I mean, that's, that's to be taken into account. I think uh, if we're coming up to all saints, and I rather like the word all qualifying saints because it reminds us that there are many unknown who lived more faithful lives than we do, who we need to remember as people that defied poverty to remain faithful Christians. Um, now, so all I'm saying is, is your question, I think, rightly reminds us that the quote canon has to be open. And it has to be open in grounds internal to its ongoing life to be rightly, to rightly tell um, uh, uh, the complexity of the narrative. I mean, we live out, we leave out um, as part of um, church history the the uh, fact that there's always been a Christianity, for example, in the ancient Near East, and um, and how those Christians negotiated reality with Islam over the years is, is crucial to, uh, to, uh, to say. Um, so I think you're quite right that we have to be open to those. I mean, how I continue to be overwhelmed by the fact that African-American Christianity which may be what Christianity should look like, um, was received by slaves. And they yet remain Christian. How extraordinary. How extraordinary. And you certainly can't uh, lose that, though we did for many years. So I take it, I take your question to be right. In, in terms of, if you, uh, 
uh, in terms of English literature I'm thinking about, I, have, you ever, have you ever thought about how silly the idea of an English department is? <laughs> what in the hell is it? Uh, is it a discipline? <laughs> Um, uh, I, um, uh, I, li I mean, I love English departments, but I don't have the slightest idea what, what they are. <laughs> My friend Stanley Fish would always say, when we would talk about it, he would say, look, we're just readers. If psychology gives up Freud, we'll take him, readers. <laughs> the, um, um, uh, and uh, I think there's much to be said for that uh, perspective. It, uh, I don't know. Uh, it, um, religious studies. Why do we have that? Because you certainly wouldn't want to have a theology department. Uh, uh, and um, uh, and so how? And they do you know wonderful work that um, uh, uh, that needs to be represented somewhere. But the idea, uh, but the idea that you know what should be included within the English department or how text should be read. Um, um, I mean, I think the history, for example, of the reading of Shakespeare um, would, uh, I think, is a fascinating history. And I say that to, to recommend my colleague Sarah Beckwith's book on Shakespeare, which is stunning about how uh, penitential processes were at the heart of Shakespeare's work. So I, you know, I, I, all I, that's just a long answer, but um, it, it, one can go on with it. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was kind of wondering if you could speak to your own thoughts about, um, just thinking about uh, and as I have been, I spent some time in the religious studies department here, um, some wonderful thinkers, and um, considering the vocation of theology and the work of theology done in the university, um, I always had sort of a hard time thinking about that while also thinking about sort of this, um, the, the Bible's in, inner dialogue about wisdom and its collection, the collection of wisdom, uh -huh. and how you have you know the Proverbs telling us to seek out wisdom, and then Ecclesiastes saying, but that endeavor is meaningless, and of the making of books there is no end, and much study makes the heart sick, right? <laughs> um, and thinking, okay, well then, how do we kind of do this practice within, uh, of, of searching out what to think about God within this very academic setting considering that the man who we are studying um, and, and reading about and trying to emulate in our lives um, did not engage in that kind of practice himself and was engaged on um, a more personal and a more human level, so seemingly. Um, and then, it, to me it seems that, sorry, this just keeps going oh. on, but a lot of thoughts. Um, <laughs> to me it seems that um, some of the more evangelical universities um, the only one that I really know people from are, is Liberty. Um, but they kind of seem to have taken up this action of, I know none of my friends that go to Liberty major in theology or religious studies. You'll learn about preaching and you'll learn about evangelism and you'll learn about social work and piloting to get people to other countries. Um, but it seems to be this very practical and lived out version of their evangelical theology. So I, I just kind of wanted to know how you, you have thought about that throughout your life. Well, I think the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Virginia is God's vengeance on Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> I, uh, I, um, uh, I, I, I don't know how it happened, but uh, um, you are a Department of Religious Studies that has taken theologians very seriously and has had wonderful theologians with other, with the other uh, disciplines within um, uh, the field of religious studies. And um, uh, it, it's interesting that it is probably the case that 
people teaching Judaica and Islamic studies are more are able to be more um, um, persuasive about why this is important than Christians can be when they teach theology. And the reason is, is because Christians have made their way into culture and the university by just sheer power. And now God is punishing us for that, and we deserve it. The, um, um, uh, as far as uh, what goes on at Liberty, deficient forms of Christianity should just be named for what they are, deficient forms of Christianity. And that's what goes on at Liberty. Um, um, uh, this is um, um, uh, evangelicals gone to seed as American uh, ideologists. And um, um, I mean, they may have a personal relationship with Jesus, but that's about the last thing a Christian should want. Um, um, because that, um, that presupposes that they have an immediate relationship to God that is not mediated by other people. So how you, how you understand the, the um, uh, introduction of people into an ongoing tradition, I think that's the reason why, I mean, see, they can't, they can't deal with the Bible because they're afraid of the historical critical method. And um, I, 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 my, I, you know, I myself, I wrote a book once called Unleashing the Scripture in which I argued that historical criticism and fundamentalism are just two sides of the same coin. They're both the result of the Protestant heresy of sola scriptura that got turned into sola text by the invention of the printing press that, um, uh, that was then given ideological formation by democratic societies that created readers that assumed that they could read texts like the scripture without spiritual guidance and moral formation. So now the American people are so corrupt, the only thing we can do is take the Bible away from them. Uh, uh, um, so, um, I mean, so I think there are serious questions about how you use historical criticism. But the, um, um, the, the continuing presumption that the text is straight up to be interpreted without the Christian tradition is just wrong at liberty. And um, I would, um, there, there are fine people that teach at liberty. Um, and, um, but notice that they continue to presuppose Christendom all the way down. Uh, therefore, you already are what you need to be. We just now to make now we need to make use of you in that way. So you've said that everyone who would serve the truth is in some way a martyr. Yeah, that's Kierkegaard. That's and, a quote well, from Kierkegaard. Right. Yeah, and I was wondering in your thoughts if you have observed or you um, believe that the modern truth bearer in a university context may be called to some form of martyrdom and what you believe that would be in a university context. There's an unselfing that goes with any serious um, intellectual um, endeavor. Um, but unselfing um, isn't necessarily martyrdom. What um, what, 
what I think, I mean, it's such a serious claim. And I'm such a bourgeois. I'd feel guilty for knowing how to give a truthful answer to that because um, who knows what it will look like? Who knows what it will look like? The, um, our, li I mean, our lives in the university are lives of such privilege and ease. And how to have to pay any serious price is not clear, it seems to me. So your question is too deep for me. Yes. Uh, you said that it uh, used to be that the danger for Christians was being discovered by your enemies, um, and nowadays it's more so being uh, recognized and rewarded for being Christian. Um, so as a theologist who has been nationally recognized, um, can you speak to us about how you balance um, the great opportunity to glorify God to more people um, with you know, trying to avoid the trap of, you know, making it about ourselves as opposed to making it about right. God. Yeah, um, I'm often identified as as a famous theologian, and it's a contradiction in terms to be a theologian this famous. Uh, um, but the the Time Magazine thing was, I was the best theologian in America. Um, not America's best theologian. Uh, where the adjective fits is, is important. And, uh, and the issue was the issue of September the 12th, 2001. <laughs> no one noticed, but, um, <laughs> but in, 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 a more, in a more serious vein, um, the, um, 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 I think um, um, I think in our culture today, one of the great um, one of the great realities is loneliness, and loneliness takes the form of the anonymity in which most of us live. And therefore, it becomes very tempting to be known. But to be known as a defeat of loneliness will only make your life hell. Because those that know you will determine who you are. So, um, uh, I, I can say, look, are you kidding? How could I take myself seriously? I'm a theologian. Um, but um, uh, I, find it, I find it a great opportunity to be able, in context like this, to um, be given the privilege of being taken seriously. But I try not to have that translate into um, uh, an ongoing way of life. And the answer that, uh, um, that makes sure that that is not, that, that that happens, the name is called Paula Gilbert. She's my wife. Um, so at the beginning of your lecture, you talked about what an extraordinary thing it was that Christianity as a tradition developed its own internal critique, and, and Christianity's ability to do that has played into your response to some of the, the questions you've been asked. So I was wondering if you would maybe talk briefly about 
what it is that you think about Christianity allows it to form it, its own internal critique and um, how maybe that process can be individualized for the modern Christian. Well, I, as, I, as I said, it's a form of madness that you believe that the power that moves the sun and the stars showed up in a Jew called Jesus. And of course, to, to say that means you also have to say um, that um, out of all the peoples of the world, I've called you Israel to be my promised people. So um, the, um, the other aspect of Christianity needing to always um, create intellectual traditions that are critical is because we are obligated to tell what's happened to us to other people. And it's called witness. And some of them think they want to be what we are, only differently. And then we got to have an argument because oftentimes they're right and we're wrong that, that have been witnesses. And uh, so the very fact that Christianity uh, is a tradition of people that have been sent out into the world to witness to the world what we think has happened to us in Christ um, is the condition that makes it continually necessary for us to rethink what we're saying and what, how we live it. So that, that's, that's what I think, and that, um, uh, that does that, I mean, it, it's really difficult because do you, um, it's, it's, not, it's not doubt that is created because how, that is, doubt is not commensurate with what your life is staked on. But it is a, a lack of fear of, or it's better, it's a matter of confidence that the God we worship really is God. And that makes possible an intellectual engagement that is, um, I think, uh, remarkable uh, over, over the history of, of the church. I think we have to make this the last question. Okay. Um, Dr. Howell Ross, thank you for, for speaking. Um, I wanted this, I don't think it's bold to say that there is no anti-war movement in the country anymore. And I won't ask you how to change that, I think, uh, because I think you might say, I don't know. But uh, a more interesting question might be, um, how in the world did that happen? And have, how have you seen that happen over your lifetime? I say I have a modest ambition before I die, which isn't that far away. Uh, I hope to convince every Christian in America that we've got a problem with war. They, they, they can be just warriors, and so on. I just want them, I mean, just war assumes war is a problem. How did it happen that Christians who worship a savior that was put to death by Rome in the new Rome think there's no problem with um, war. And um, I, in terms of how to recover it, we won't recover it until, as it happened in Vietnam, you have to, you have to draft the middle class to fight a war. <laughs> then, 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 then you may get it, get an anti-war movement again. Um, because right now no one is in jeopardy other than those that are volunteers. Um, uh, and um, what I hope, have hope in, 
is God is full of surprises. So um, as part of recovery of what it means to be a Christian in Christendom, we discover that um, we just can't kill people. And uh, that will put us in danger in a way that uh, our kids will probably have to pay the price for and we won't. Thank you very much. Thank you.